That was really good. I didn't even write that down. Nice. <laughs> Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Many critics of the Book of Mormon point out there are anachronisms like horses, steel, and other things that didn't happen in the ancient Americas. What does Brian Hales think about these anachronisms? Are they a deal breaker? We'll also talk about tight versus loose translation of the Book of Mormon. Some faithful scholars believe that the words appeared on a rock and Joseph translated those exactly as they were produced from God's Word. In another theory, known as loose translation, some faithful scholars believe that uh, Joseph Smith used his own intellect to create the Book of Mormon. Which of those two theories does Dr. Brian Hales uh, prefer? Find out more in our next conversation. You won't want to miss it. Check it out. Well, let me throw in a, th a, a gap for you then. Okay. Well, how do you explain anachronisms, steel, horses, um, elephants, those sorts of things, which if it took place in America, there's no horses. They didn't, they didn't use steel. They didn't even have wheels. Um, you know, it talks about chariots. There's no temple like unto Solomon. Um, do you have any explanation for that? Well, for me, I think anachronisms are the weakest criticism of the Book of Mormon for, for several reasons. Um, first off, the, we haven't done all of the excavations yet. Some of these items, maybe not all of them, but some of them could still be discovered. They have LIDAR studies of northern Guatemala and the Yucatan of, of Mexico. And these LIDAR studies show that there are people that live there of, of 7 to 11 million in a 40,000 uh, square mile radius area. And 3 to 5 percent of those have been excavated. So there's, there's lots of, of things that still could be discovered um, in the anachronisms. Another reason I think anachronisms are weak is that if you've ever translated from one language to a number, another, some of the literal qualities of, of an item may be lost or new literal qualities may be gained. Uh, you know, silk. Did they have silkworms there? Probably not. Did they have shiny material? Maybe so. And so some of these things can be explained away. Now, you mentioned horses, a great example, because what we find in the Book of Mormon, horses, I think, are mentioned 11 times, and they are mentioned with chariots. There's no mention of, of wheels. Um, but what's interesting is in Joseph's day, a horse was ridden. A horse would pull a, a, a wagon with wheels. Um, it was used in cavalry, uh, you know, to, to ride in with cavalry, cavalry yeah, to, to in battle. Well, we don't find any of those things in the Book of Mormon. You don't ride on horses so far as it says in the Book of Mormon. Uh, they are only associated with royalty and with a chariot of some sort, and we don't know exactly. People make assumptions of wheels, and they think Ben-Hur and all of this. You know, We don't know what the word chariot signifies. Well, I mean, if they came from the old world, wouldn't you expect Ben-Hur to be in America? You, well, with chariots, because they they pulled the Egyptians pulled horses, pulled chariots with horses, right? I mean, wouldn't you expect the same sort of thing in America? Well, chariots are mentioned so seldom that I, I don't know that we should assume they have wheels. If they had wheels, don't don't we think we would probably have more mention of the use of the wheel in the Book of Mormon? We we don't. We're making an assumption there, and and I understand, but this could be just translation on the word chariot, and and the chariot is only mentioned, I think, four times. We'd have to go back and look. So again, this particular anachronism to me is is not a a, a real problem because the horses in the Book of Mormon are not doing what horses did in Joseph Smith's day. Now, the third reason I don't think anachronisms are very strong is that the the Book of Mormon we talk about it as a translation. It wasn't a translation in any traditional sense. Joseph didn't know the the engravings. He didn't know Reformed Egyptian. The uh, the plates were in the in the woods, or they were covered up on the table. Joseph Smith was receiving a revelation based upon the Book of Mormon. So we call it a translation, but it's a revelation. It's coming from God. Every word he's getting through inspiration from God. And if God is giving a revelation, that he would upgrade that for the target audience it would be expected. That's the way God works. If we were getting a very literal translation of those engravings, 
The syntax would be very clunky. It would be difficult to understand. It would have references to things that we would not understand. And so for me, and, and several other authors are understanding this, um, Grant Hardy, Royal Skousen, Richard Bushman have all made statements to the point that they think God has upgraded this text, this revelation to Joseph, um, because the target it's made for the target audience. It's made for us, to help us. And so this is where we get the King James references, the uh, Sermon on the Mount coming into this. Clearly, the Sermon on the Mount wasn't using this same knocking on doors and loaves of bread and, and things. Um, th this is something that is an upgrade to the text, and it, it makes total sense if we think of the Book of Mormon as a revelation given to Joseph that, that was custom made uh, for our generation. Well, that's interesting. So, because I know there's also the issue of tight translation, loose translation. <laughs> um, you know, there's the, I'm trying to remember who it was, one of the early uh, witnesses said that the words would appear in the stone. Uh, Whereas a lot of people like, it sounds like you're going with loose translation. Is that, is that accurate? Do you know, um, I think, I, I've, I've never really embraced Royal Skousen's, and he's a lot smarter than I am. I'm not even worthy to be mentioned in the same sentence as Royal because his, his research is so amazing. But um, I have put together an article, I can't find a publisher on it, that gives us um, seven reasons to believe Joseph Smith was not reading a seer stone, a teleprompter seer stone, and four really good reasons to think that he was reading a teleprompter seer stone. But the biggest obstacle for the loose and tight is that the more Joseph is wordsmithing the sentences, the worse the sentences are going to be. Now, there are sentences with problems, but almost any sentence in that book is going to be more difficult for than Joseph could do using his own intellectual abilities as this 23-year-old farmer. And that's why I really think that, that everything is coming to him and he's helping out. He's giving very little assistance. We do find uh, poor grammar in there that must have come from Joseph. And then we have my friend Brent Metcalf pointed out that the wherefore, therefore shift. Have you, have you heard about that? That, Vaguely, but yeah, well, remind us. The two words are basically the same meaning in English, but Joseph is using therefore for the first part, and then he switches to wherefore for the second part of the translation as he's going along. That's a shift that seems to be a mental choice that Joseph would have made. We don't know for sure, but, but these are just some of the reasons why you would not think Joseph is reading a teleprompter stone, even though there are several eyewitnesses that say that's what he said or believe that that's what he was doing. But the, the more we want to consign Joseph as the actual author of the sentence structure, the more we're going to have to give him cognitive ability because um, wordsmithing, final draft sentences in real time is a very difficult process. And I don't think Joseph could do it. I know I couldn't do it. I've, I've you know, written three 500 plus page books and have some experience with composition. No way could I do this? You've got this editing process is necessary as, as soon as my brain gets involved. And I don't think Joseph was able to do it either. So I, I have to attribute most of these words to something beyond Joseph's wordsmithing ability. Okay. So you, you're definitely in the loose translation. If camp. that's how it, it, how it works, I, I don't think he's contributing a great deal because if he were, I think the sentences would have really worse grammar than, and they would have New York grammar, not early English grammar. Well, and do you think that we should get away from the word translation and refer to the Book of Mormon as a revelation? I think that for understanding what happened, that would be wise. But the Lord uses the word translate to, to identify what he's doing. But also, Joseph is translating the New Testament and the Bible to create the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. And, and all he's doing is staring at a, at a copy of the Bible and dictating a revelation. Or, or I know there's controversy now. Was he borrowing from other sources and yeah, things? Yeah, Adam and, Miller. I don't know uh, Tom uh, Wayman has Tom, mentioned that. Tom's come out on that. I, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm less impressed that that's really that important. But he's upgrading the text with the Spirit. And the Spirit may give him words, as it did for the Book of, Mormon, Book of Moses section, or maybe he's just inspiring him to say, yeah, include this, this new idea. Maybe you heard it at the revival or whatever to upgrade the text to help with understanding. That was Joseph's goal there. Uh, so, so I think, though, that thinking of, of more revelatory is, is wiser because Joseph wasn't that smart in, in, in 1829. 
uh, he wasn't dumb, he, but he, was, he didn't have great experience. And, and these things that, that are truly remarkable just could not have come from him based on what the historical record describes. Hmm. Interesting. Well, and I know I had a recent conversation about the book. Well, I think it was about the first vision, but it kind of morphed into the, into the Book of Mormon. And I remember at that fireside, you had a graph um, that talked about different authors. And one of them was uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. And uh, how many words that compares? So. He'll probably put this up there, but there it is, if you yeah. can see it right there. So tell us why uh, Joseph and J.R.R. Tolkien are, are different. Well, uh, Joseph is probably compared to Tolkien more than any other author. I mean, Tolkien created this artificial world with um, 200 and something named individuals, more than the Book of Mormon. Um, but it, it has geography, like the Book of Mormon. It, it has a, a proper English, which is kind of like the Book of Mormon. Harold Bloom, who was a, a non-Latter-day Saint um, author, said once that when he reads Tolkien, he, he's reminded of the Book of Mormon, you know, that kind oh. of a thing. But that wasn't a compliment to either. Uh, but but that's what but the comparison is there. But if you look at the <laughs> it chart, reminds me Mark Twain called it chloroform in print too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Twain Twain was not impressed with the Book of Mormon. <laughs> but the interesting thing about Joseph is that he produces his his major work first. Um, it comes out of nowhere. Again, nobody who knows Joseph remembers him practicing for the oration, the oral performance. And nobody remembers him practicing writing stories or creating stories, plot lines, storylines, um, characters for stories. It comes out of the blue. And then that's it. Now, I did a study. It was published in The Interpreter where I compared Joseph to all kinds of authors. There are authors that produce one-hit wonders, if you will. So Joseph's not alone there. But what's interesting for Joseph is that he's very young. And there's no preliminary for the, there's no different drafts of the text. But if we look at Tolkien, he wrote Lord of the Rings when he was 63, 64. And he sent uh, different drafts to his so publisher. He's 40 years older. Yeah. But he has worked as, as a college professor, at, I think it was Oxford, for many years teaching uh, literature courses. And he's working through different drafts of his books. He sent one section to C.S. Lewis, which, and, and there are people who know a lot more about this than I do, but the process of getting Lord of the Rings is so distinct from getting the Book of Mormon. There's really, uh, it's, it's not good to try to... Uh, How long did it take Tolkien to, for, for, from start to end, would you say? Well, if we look at the graph, he published The Hobbit when he was 57, and then we find him five years later coming up with Lord of the Rings. So that that's somewhat of a timeline. But how long he been working on The Hobbit? Because it's you know it's the same geography. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know that answer. But uh, uh, I also compared Joseph to Shakespeare. But five oh. years versus three months, right? I mean, well, is that what we're saying? Right. Although I guess some some would argue that well, if you count those four years with these Moroni visits. You could count. You could make that into years as well. Well, it's a very important ingredient in most intellect theories. Is that Joseph was preparing behind the scenes prior to 1829, mm -hmm. and they don't quite know what to do with the lost 116 pages. I mean, people have said, "Well, that was just the first draft." Well, not really, because if you're going to have a second draft, you take the first draft and you upgrade it. But the first draft was lost. So you can't really call that a first draft, except maybe he's learning how to dictate or something. But you wouldn't have gained a lot of experience if you lose that and can't refer to it. So, so the, the actual dictation that, that Oliver Cowdery recorded really isn't a second draft in that sense. Um, but I, I do compare Joseph to... Uh, you said Oliver Cowdery. You meant Martin Harris. Well, Mar well Mar Martin lost it. Martin lost it. But then when Joseph is recording with Oliver... Okay. It wouldn't be the second draft because he's lost the first draft and there's no way to refer to it. So, yeah, Martin did the 116 pages and lost him. And then, then Oliver shows up a year later and does the rest, mostly. But uh, Shakespeare, uh, he was very constant in producing his, his plays. But by his, the age that he produced his very first play, 26... By the time Joseph Smith was 26, he had produced 85% of everything that he was going to do. 
and that's the age that Shakespeare is writing his first play. Just kind of an interesting observation. Um, and I like J.K. Rowling because I, I do like the Harry Potter movies. Um, good storytelling to my mind. Um, but again, she was quite a bit older, and she's using word processors and, and lots of things Joseph didn't have. But Joseph does kind of stick out unique because he just peaks at such a young age, and then you just have a few things that show up after that. Interesting. All right, well, is there anything else you, you want to share? No, you've been very kind to listen, and uh, I, I would love to see the naturalists um, just discuss the gap. For how many years have, have all of these theories that I've compiled, really only Bill Davis is trying to tell us how someone could cognitively do this. If you wanted to reverse engineer the Book of Mormon and, and discover how much cognitive ability would be needed, I think you, you arrive at a place that is greater than human performance studies have even shown could happen. And, but, but that's an unexplored field. If Joseph is doing an oral performance, let's break it down. Let's try to figure out how he did it. Let's try to replicate it if we can. And if we can, great, then we've, we've explained it. If we can't, that brings up questions that we, we ought to, in the interest of transparency, take a look at. Yeah. Well, great. Well, any other projects you're working on after this one? Well, no, actually, I've kind of slowed down on this one. I'm, I'm, uh, Are you trying to get a book out of this or anything? Eventually, or? yeah. Okay. I'd like to, so. Well, cool. And so no other Mormon history projects? Well, maybe not for a while. There's so many, uh, you know, in 2007, uh, we didn't have the environment we have today with the Joseph Smith Papers Project and, and so many professional uh, historians that are, are doing the work and helping out. Uh, amateur historians like me are finding, I think, less, less of a, a niche. So, and maybe <laughs> that's a good thing. Probably good for everybody. <laughs> All right. Well... Dr. Brian Hales, I thank you for being here on Gospel Tangents. Well, thank you, Rick. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Brian Hales. Brian, thanks for sitting down with me. It was great to getting back together again. Um, I'd tell people to buy your polygamy books, but I think they're sold out. But, you know, they are available. Used copies still out there on Amazon and other vendors. So definitely check those out. And so, Brian, I'm also looking forward to seeing um, what other things you have uh, on Book of Mormon authorship. It's going to be a lot of fun. In our next conversation, I'm excited to look at a non-member view of the Book of Mormon. Dr. Christopher Smith is a Pentecostal theologian, and we're going to get some of his impressions of the Book of Mormon. With other religious traditions, they're either drawn to it to try to talk about what the differences are and I'm really kind of a textually based person, and I know how to read texts. And so there's a lot of ways in which, you know, the Book of Mormon text is what I'm interested in, in all of that. Um, I was talking to Grant Hardy once, and, and he, he said, so Book of Mormon, why not Mormonism? And I said, are you nuts? If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe for just $5 a month at patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview before everybody else if you'd like to watch the entire video for just eight dollars a month you can either subscribe on youtube patreon or my website gospeltangents.com just click, click the yellow subscribe button and i'll add you to our gospel tangents insiders group so that you can see entire videos for those interested in a pdf transcript you can subscribe at either patreon or on my website for just $10 a month, I'll send you a PDF as soon as it's complete. If you'd like a copy of the paperback as well as a PDF, just sign up for $20 a month at either Patreon or my website, gospeltangents.com. Of course, you can buy individual transcripts at amazon.com and just do a search for Gospel Tangents interview and you can see all the things that we have there. Don't forget to support Gospel Tangents with an awesome t-shirt like one of these. You can subscribe at Apple Podcasts at tinyurl.com slash gospeltangents. Get our latest updates at facebook.com slash gospeltangents. Also, you can get our Twitter updates at gospeltangents. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got more of our great videos. Thanks again.